with Presley and his mom, Stephanie, and they're from Woodruff, South Carolina, joining us on the I Believe podcast to talk about Presley's diagnosis in honor of childhood cancer awareness. My name is Presley Jackson, and I was diagnosed with ocular melanoma in December of 2018. At the time, it was confusing, and it was kind of like shocking, like you had to take a second for it to sink in. And I think really it's just now sinking in and I'm beginning to understand and reevaluate and live my life after this weird three or four year gap that's been in between. I'm using it to, I guess, spread awareness to ocular melanoma, childhood cancer, and really using it to put my voice out there on YouTube and every other social media platform. So it's really, I guess, helped me find a footing and awareness for it. Presley, having been kind of following your journey as you've started sharing more on social media, it's been pretty amazing to see just how empowering it is for you to start sharing more and to start being more aware. How would you say or when would you say that shift happened that you became more aware of, of what your diagnosis was and kind of what that entailed? I guess I became more aware really at the start of this year. So January, February, March of this year, I began to realize and, you know, become more aware and start spreading awareness and it has played an effect into everything I've done since then. In the last five or six, seven months of my life, I've been aware and spreading it and using it in every aspect of my life from school to sports, social media, every part of my life. So when you say you became aware, was there anything specific that, that kind of triggered that? Like, do you feel like, like, did you just have questions one day and you asked your mom, what is my diagnosis? What is this? What does this mean? Or did you Google? What did it look like for you to kind of first discover more about like what ocular melanoma was for you and how it was, you know, going to potentially or had already affected your life and how it would continue to affect your life? It was really a mixture of both asking and my mom and then also doctors, therapists, everywhere from coaches and sports about how it's going to affect my life now, how it's going to affect my life five or 10 years from now with driving, sports, school, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's really how it started, how it's going to affect my life and how I can work around obstacles such as being blind in one eye and how I can continue living my life and making every moment count. I love that. And I think that's, that's such a powerful way to, I think, kind of approach learning about this is learning about it as it affects you and learning about it as you're kind of confronted with the different hurdles that you have to overcome. And like you said, the obstacles that kind of come in your way. Um, so let's talk a little bit about like some of the obstacles that you've had to overcome or to kind of grapple with so far. I know you, you mentioned, you talked in the, the little excerpt that you wrote, you talked about sports and how this has affected your pitching game. So talk to us a little bit about like what are kind of the mindsets that have helped you in pitching to kind of overcome this and to keep working through it because obviously you love baseball. Baseball is a huge part of my life and pitching is a huge part of my life. So to take that step back and having to regroup because going up onto the mound with one eye, it messes with your depth perception and your reaction time. So it's scarier to go up there and have to compete against people who aren't missing depth perception. So I guess the mindset I go up there with is nothing is impossible. People like to count people out and say the odds are against you, but I believe the odds are never against you. And I guess I'm living proof of that. I was told two or three years ago that I wouldn't be able to pitch. And if I had to pitch, I would have to wear like a helmet to go up there and pitch. And here I am two or three years later pitching in huge games that mean a lot to people and not having a uh, difficulty doing it or the odds against me. So the mindset that nothing is impossible. I love that. Tell me, you know, kind of what does school look like for you now? Obviously you're in high school. I, I feel like it was an important period of time in my life. So talk to us a little about what has high school looked like? You've, you've basically gone through your entire high school career with this diagnosis. What started out and maybe what was difficult and what has changed since then? When I went to public school in high school where it's seven hours a day and you're in the bright lights of the classroom and really nowadays everything here is on the computer. So that would really mess with me and I would have horrible headaches and it would just really drain me of energy. So I would say sophomore year of high school was rough. But not like from the sports or friends wise. That part of high school was incredible and the events and the atmosphere. But I'd say the work and the stress on my eye and the energy it took was really draining. And then I've made this jump to homeschool, which has really changed my life for the better. Now my schedule is on me. It's less, it's almost all paperwork. So I don't have to worry about the stress of computers or the lights going into my eye. And if I do have a headache coming on, I can take a break, take an hour off and then regroup 
and the schedule is super flexible. So doctor's appointments no longer affect my schedule. I'm no longer falling behind if I have to go to Philadelphia or wherever I have to go for doctors. So I feel like the high school experience has gotten 10 times better since switching to homeschool. The friends in the atmosphere are still just as amazing. I love my teachers as well. Okay. I love that. What helps you as you are more aware, obviously of your diagnosis and kind of the weight that that carries in your life. What helps you as you go into doctor's appointments for your eye, for, for scans, do you have more of an awareness about like kind of what, what can shift? And, and I guess maybe my other question would be, has this affected your general health in any other ways? Well, I feel like my general health has gotten 10 times better. I'm in better shape than I was in 2018. It's helped played a part in me getting healthier and staying healthier. The mindset going into doctor's appointments, because it is scary to go to doctor's appointments. You never know if something's going to change. So definitely praying and religion like that and having the backup of family and friends and the support of all of that really helps get through the day. I love that. Presley, seriously, it's been so amazing just seeing how much you've grown as a person. And and I love seeing what you're doing. And I'm going to throw in one extra question. You mentioned that you feel really strongly about spreading awareness now about your diagnosis. So can you maybe tell us the top three things that as a high schooler you're currently doing to help spread awareness about ocular melanoma in your way? Going on social media and saying that this is a cancer that is real, it's not a fake thing, and it's, it's super rare, so to spread awareness that way on social media and platforms like that. And then in sports, I have armbands and cleats and stuff that has the ocular melanoma and a Cure Insight logo to spread awareness when I'm on the field talking to people. And in school as well, I do a lot of work in school spreading the awareness for ocular melanoma and talking to people about it and in doctor's office, so spreading the awareness in every category. So you're doing such an amazing job. And I look forward just to seeing like how you continue to thrive as you go into your senior year, I believe is coming up next, right? That's going to be super exciting. And I just, I'm excited to see how you do with, as your baseball career, you know, continues in high school and maybe beyond. Um, I hope it continues beyond. Come on, let's like put that out in the universe if you want that. Okay. So Stephanie, we're going to move over to you. And we're going to talk a little bit more about like the parental side of things. Obviously you had a 13 year old when he was diagnosed and he's now... 17, how this has changed for you. Because I know when Presley was first diagnosed, you guys didn't really like flood him with information. You let it be a little bit more vague for a little while and, and you would tell him what he needed to know, not everything, or not all the scary statistics, not all of the, you know, like, not all of the details. So as he started asking more questions and wanting to learn more, what's that been like for you as a parent? So I would say for me, it's kind of the reverse than what he described. I think it's been much harder as he's gotten older, I think that there was a bit of peace or relief for us that he didn't carry that heavy burden when he was 13, 14, 15, 16, you know what I mean? I feel like it's a lot to carry. And we all decided from his immediate family to our extended family, who had obviously looked into what ocular melanoma was, the statistics, that that just was not something that we really focused on. And we we did. We purposely kept it vague and we kept it really positive. And he helped in that. I think I said the last time that one of the blessings I'm super thankful for is that kids are really resilient and kids, you know, they believe they're superheroes and can make it through everything. And that's amazing. And I wish that would always stay for everybody. And as he has gotten older, for, on my perspective, one of the reasons we were so apprehensive to give him a phone, it wasn't because he's not responsible. He's a very responsible person. It was because the phone opens up social media. It opens up these different things that, you know, we knew it was time. He didn't have a phone until he was 14. And even at 14, he only was allowed to have Instagram. He didn't have anything else. So it was just within this last year, he was allowed to get a Snapchat and the YouTube to do some of his videos and the Polaroid project. And I didn't love the idea of that. I still sometimes don't love the idea of that. He was able to research a ton. And I just worried that you can get caught in that loop. You can get caught in, you know, everything that you read. And I think that he's done an amazing job. And, and I probably need to learn from him that he's done an amazing job at kind of keeping that in check and understanding. And I think on the other side of that too, we've had to answer a lot of questions. People around us, loved ones, close family members, maybe they looked it up for a second, but they always seem very confused. We often get the question like, why isn't Presley rung the bell? Isn't Presley in remission? Because the 
childhood cancer cases around us that our schools are unfortunately so familiar with are kids who, you know, go through a period of time of treatment and thank goodness come out the other side and ring the bell and you have these celebrations. That's what our our school and our network of people were used to seeing. So they don't really understand it and they don't understand why he's always getting scanned. And we've heard comments from, I mean, I heard somebody say to a friend of a friend, like, why is she still continuing to post? And I don't think that they meant it mean spirited. I think they just really didn't understand that we're still getting scanned every three months. We're still seeing his ocular oncologist every four months. We still travel to Philadelphia. This isn't a, I tell people we're in this long marathon. It was never a sprint. And I I think a lot of people just don't understand that. I think that's such an important point to make is just that that lack of awareness in the general public about how this diagnosis isn't something that, you know, you ring the bell at the end of, you know, a year of treatment or the, the week of plaque. I mean, let me be honest. I think we could ring the bell. We could ring the bell and be like, yay, we finished this part. But like you said, like it's it's like a phase in the marathon. And we're really, we're really all in this as like, I mean, it's, it's kind of a, like a lifelong journey of figuring out how to navigate this. I'm, I've talked to other people with different cancers and cancer does still affect their everyday life, whether they've been in treatment or, and they finished and they rang the bell and they're considered in remission or they're still actively fighting. Like cancer is always going to be a part of people's lives when they've been diagnosed. It's just a matter of how much space does it take up. And like you said, with with doctor's appointments every three to four months, like it takes up a lot of space. It takes up a lot of mental energy. It takes up a lot of emotional energy. And that's something that, you know, as a parent, you carry and you also have your now older teenager who's carrying it too. Like you said, carrying it in different ways, but it's still something that you continue to carry and carry at a much higher frequency than most people expect. Um, So I think that's, that's a really good point to just kind of bring awareness to that. As a parent, as you've gone through this diagnosis, what have been some of the things that have been helpful and supportive for you, whether it's been your family, your friends, what are kind of the best parental supports that you've had? Both Presley and I, we we do. We have the most amazing family who literally from right when he was diagnosed, we were driving to Philadelphia, showed up at our hotel, and here came all three of my siblings from different parts of the country, showed up at the hotel and were there. We had people move in to take care of our other children. You know, we we have an amazing family and they have done their due diligence. They all carry that weight. They know all about ocular melanoma. They are all over, you know, they're very involved with the websites, they're very involved in funding and all of these different pieces. So we're super, super lucky there. And I would really say the different that when we, when he was first diagnosed, literally at Dr. Bergstrom's office, a lady handed me a card and on the back of it was the Facebook ocular melanoma page. And I'm forever thankful for that card. Through that card, we met, I mean, too many people to name, but you know, that's how we learned about you. That's how we learned about so many people along the way who really from the start held my hand and said, go here, go here, don't go here, don't do this. And then I was able to pass that along because locally we didn't have any of that. And his team of pediatric oncologists here are amazing. They are amazing, but they were very clear. They were very clear when we, our first appointment, none of them had ever heard of ocular melanoma. They had never treated an ocular melanoma patient. I think they had had one retinoblastoma, blastoma, am I saying that correctly? Maybe one that had come through the entire practice in all these years. So they were learning along with us. So the way it works for Presley is when he goes and sees, whether we're seeing Dr. Shields in Philadelphia or when we see Dr. Bergstrom and we've got Dr. Sato involved, everyone develops this new plan that gets adjusted every three to six months that then go to the oncologist here and they kind of follow suit. So we've had amazing doctors, but that that can be frustrating too because I think we often feel like guinea pigs, <laughs> you know, we often feel like, God, are they going to, are they going to know what to look for? You know, when I read your stuff, you know, are they going to know, are these doctors that are local that aren't as familiar with this, are they going to know what to look for? Are we going to know, you know, like those sorts of things are what we've had a lot of support with what, what I, as the mom, because that's what I think about. And I have a family that, you know, when it gets tough or when those things creep in typically around scan time, as I'm sure, you know, at this point, I feel like my sisters, I don't even have to, it's, it's on everyone's calendars, but 
it's gotten to the point where they're just like me. I can tell most of the time I'm really good about my schedule, but about a week before the scan week comes, I can tell. I can tell I'm getting a little bit on edge or I can tell there's just a different vibe that I normally have. And my sisters know immediately and I notice that text messages start coming more frequently. I notice things with Presley, like we all just rally during that time. So we're so lucky there. Yeah. That's my answer. Let's talk about the flip side of that. Obviously, you guys have been on this journey for almost four years in the pediatric world. And like, I mean, smack dab in the middle of it. It's probably a totally different thing. I know we have Arjun across the world in the UK who he was diagnosed at birth. And I can't even fathom that. Like, that's absolutely insane to me. But like, I mean, Presto was diagnosed smack dab in the middle of childhood. What kinds of parental support and just general, I guess, what do you feel like you have been missing or you wish you had had as you kind of went through this earlier on? And or or what would you advise other parents who are kind of smack dab in the middle of this? Like, what would you tell them to pay attention to, to kind of let go? Those kinds of things. I would say with regards to the care side of it, sometimes I feel like there's a lot of things missing. If we're not, I feel like when we're in Philadelphia, when we're in this community, I feel very well supported. I feel that the people that we're talking to are very well educated. And because they're so well educated about ocular melanoma, they're empathetic about the things that they say and the things that they do. I feel like that's not always what we run into in our lives. And I don't think, again, it's done purposefully. I just feel like people don't understand. I, I think people in general don't understand a lot of, as you pointed out, a lot of what people go through when they're diagnosed with cancer or a terminal illness or any number of things. So I would say I definitely, I feel like at our school specifically, in our school district, when he was diagnosed at the junior high level in seventh grade, we had the most amazing group of teachers at that time who really, really worked hard to learn about it and to make Presley feel included because at that very same time, we had another child in his school that had been diagnosed with leukemia and we had a little girl at the intermediate school had been diagnosed with leukemia. So we had these three kids and then about six months after Presley, another child, all going through it. And the school did an amazing job of including Presley within that. As we've gotten older and the schools have gotten bigger and it's a bigger community and it's not that same group of teachers that kind of remembers that, I feel like there is some exclusion there. I definitely feel like we, I saw something the other day and it wasn't specifically for our high school, but you know, they were doing ch- like pediatric cancer awareness, you know, cancer, childhood cancer awareness. And we weren't reached out to because I think it just kind of gets missed. And I feel like that to something is simple when we, right after, I think it was two or three days after Presley was originally diagnosed, I was sitting on my porch and I got a call from a make, from somebody with Make-A-Wish and I was livid. I was livid. And of course, Presley being like a kid, when I told him about this afterwards, he was like, what? Why wouldn't you have just said yes that day? But I was like, I don't want to be a parent that gets a call from Make-A-Wish I don't want, like, it was just too much. So then as we went through the treatment, and again, you know how this goes. You know, for us, what that looked like was 27 days in Philadelphia. You know, we, and having our kids and everything it entailed for us, it was just crazy. Just this crazy lump of six to eight months. So we were at like that six, eight, nine month lump. And I reached back out to them because at that point in time, we were like, oh, we kind of caught our breath. And I got a, a letter back and they were like, well, we looked into ocular melanoma and he doesn't qualify. And I was like, really? Really? And that's something like so minor, but it's those sorts of things like as the person front row seeing what he, what you, as well as every other child I've had, you know, we go into clinic. We're literally there monthly. We go to these appointments every three months. We watch women holding their children with no hair and they're getting their chemo. We watch kids. We see the signs on the walls of kids that don't make it out of that. We see all of that. You know, that sucks for all of us. That sucks for you. That sucks for us. We watch, you know, even watching someone like you, like it's very hard to see your updates and think, dang, you know what I mean? Dang, they're, you know, young. How is this happening? And and see that there's little funding and see, we'll go to something. We try to attend as much as we can and we'll go to, there was something not that long ago with regards to leukemia and they had raised something crazy, 30,000. It was amazing. And it was just incredible. And we both talked about it and I was like, dang, just imagine if we could figure out a way to do that for ocular melanoma. I just think that 
the numbers are so small, you know, it kind of gets put in that category that the numbers are so small that the funding's not there. Because we've had doctors, you know, I don't know what it would look like if one of Presley's scans changed, you know, and, and I don't think the doctors know either. I, I don't know where they'd put us because one of the things we still run into, now we're one year away and that's what we've prayed for this entire time, is right now at 17, he wouldn't qualify for almost anything. The injections that a lot of patients get in his eye, he doesn't get that. He has to get a, a different steroid because it's not FDA approved for someone under the age of 18. And we faced a lot of things around, along the way. We faced issues with our insurance company because he's a kid and there's not many kids with it. And those are things that, you know, are beyond frustrating. <laughs> No, that, I mean, that for sure makes sense. And I can't even, I mean, like you said, like it's frustrating. It's frustrating for me, but it's frustrating to see it's, I'm rare. You know, all of us are rare as far as this diagnosis goes, but Presley's rare among rare. I feel like if we do the statistics, he's probably like less than a person is the amount of percentage like that he has a chance of even having gotten this. And yet obviously here he is. I can, I can understand that that would be, that would be so incredibly frustrating to be dealing with the insurance kind of caveats and all of the ins and outs of that and what that looks like. And to have to kind of repeatedly explain, no, this is why this is necessary to have. I mean, thank goodness you have a good team. You have a good care team of, of all of these people working together. Together, which I'm sure helps in kind of some of those battles with insurance, so to speak, but like to have to continue to repeat it and to be like, no, like we do need this. This is why here's all the doctors that say why. And like to just not be believed and to not have it stay with you because, because like you said, like there's a lot of people who go through cancer and, and they go through a year, maybe two, maybe three, and then they're in remission and they're like, they're in the safe zone and, and they maybe have blood work or they have scans every year or, but it's a much lower frequency and it doesn't take up as much of their, their time. And so to have a cancer that behaves so differently and to have to be on watch for that as a, as a parent, as a family, I mean, it's, it's a full-time job. It's an absolute full full-time job. And so, I mean, I think, like you said, I think leaning into those kinds of supports that you do have, but I think calling attention to some of the things that are missing. That's, I mean, that's a huge, that's a huge thing to me. And I mean, I sincerely hope someone who has a connection with Make-A-Wish will share this with them and point out like, hey, no, this was not okay. Like Presley, like whether or not he is, he is actively like has active known disease is irrelevant here. Like he's a child who has gone through cancer. I mean, sorry, Presley, I know you're not like a child, child anymore, but, but you know what I mean? At 13, like that, that would have been amazing. That would have been such a unique experience to be able to get to do something and to pick something that maybe you wouldn't have the ability to do otherwise. And frankly, who cares if ocular melanoma is small and, and little, that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean that it affects you differently. I think cancer affects us all in a universal way. And obviously some of the, the nuances of that look different for people, but I think it just goes to show that like, you just never know. There are plenty of people, I mean, even outside of ocular melanoma who go through a cancer diagnosis and they don't look sick. You know, they don't, they don't look like they have cancer and not that, not that Presley is sick. You're not sick. I'm not sick. We're all fine. We're healthy, but we have this underlying threat of illness that could show up or it could not. And we have no control over when, or if that could happen. We have no way of knowing precisely when it could happen, if it is going to happen. So the lack of control around that, and just, I mean, like you said, living, living between scans, like all of these different things play into play into this. So, I mean, I, I think that, like you said, I think it's really important that we recognize that just because it looks different doesn't make it less valid and doesn't make it less worthy of, of being, you know, being known about. And if anything, I think it makes it more important that we, you know, continue to spread awareness for that. Yes, I agree. I agree completely. And with that, I didn't mean that to come across that we were complaining because I think basically the, the route we were already taking at that time is, okay, there's a reason for all of this. And we, we talked about this the last time we met with you. We had to, I had to regroup because I like controlling a lot of things and we had to regroup. Our family had to regroup and we just made the decision with Presley kind of steering that ship that we were going to live it up, <laughs> that we were going to do all we could to really get the most out of life, which I don't know if we would have, you know, everyone's life gets, we were very much prior to this, a family, you know, these three boys, everybody in school and sports and running and this, I feel like we were taxi drivers and running and, and everything was so fast. And this has definitely caused us to take a breath and to pause and just be really intentional. And I'm, and I'm forever thankful for that. But it's those sorts of little things that it is. It's awful. It's awful. I mean, I really think that Make-A-Wish should take all of you guys. I mean, I just can't. 
Yes. I can't. It's just, it's a hard, it's hard. It's hard. I know that it's hard for Presley at times and I'm blown away often that it's as, you know, I rarely see those times because I mean, that's just a testament to him and his character and his soul with regards to this whole, you know, matter. And, but yeah. No, I mean, I, I agree. I think just seeing how you guys as a family have tackled this and just, just how, like you said, like how you've just approached life as a result of the last almost four years and, and the things that become more important. I think those are definitely, you know, those are, those are just important gifts to recognize. They're not gifts we ever really would have asked for in the same way, like to have it happen the way that it happens, but, but they are gifts nonetheless. Nonetheless, that kind of extra presence, the the circumstantial desire for being here and being in the now and to to not wait for doing certain things, things that are important to you. So on that note, I actually wanted to shift back and ask Presley something that I forgot to talk to you about. So Presley, sorry, Presley, your mom has mentioned the Polaroid project a couple times. And I know I've seen you talk a little bit about it. I've seen your social media. So I wanted to give you a chance just to tell us like, what is the Polaroid project and why did you start it this last um, few months? So the Polaroid project, it, it feels like a very simple thing is capture memories on film. It's an initiative to go create memories and then to capture them on film and say, hey, we have all these incredible memories from the past year and the next coming years. It's turning dreams into memories. The quote I like to say is, die with amazing memories, not amazing dreams. So I feel like the Polaroid project just helps me make that happen, make it reality. And, and it's been really cool seeing some of the, I know like over the summer, I feel like you went to all these crazy ghost places and like scary places, like the most haunted places in your area. And I'm sitting there looking and I'm reading and I'm just like, oh, it gives me the creeps. Just seeing some of the places that you've gone, I'm like, oh, I can't, I can't even do that, but more power to you. But I think that's such, that's such an amazing and powerful way of thinking of just that idea that just don't live life waiting for the dreams to come eventually. Take memories now, whether it's pictures or, you know, mental memories, and just to really be, in, you know, be intentional, be present with what you do and how you live your life. And, and don't just, don't put everything on the back burner and wait for it to happen because you just, we never have, we never have those guarantees. And I think if, if anything, this diagnosis helps give us that perspective that like nobody has a guarantee at all, whether they have this diagnosis or not. And so just to be able to, to really be intentional with that. Well, as we wrap up, is there anything else that either of you would like to share? I don't have anything specific. We definitely wanted to thank you. I, there's there's several people. I'm going to give Ashley McCrary a little shout out here. You know, when in the early, she was one of the first or second people that had reached out to me amongst a whole bunch of people that had reached out. And we definitely, Presley and I both watched her journey really close. And especially because we're, you know, visiting a lot of the same places and we're like, okay, we're going to look at what she did this last time. We're going to try to like, it's been a good roadmap. And then when you came along, it was like this great beacon of hope. Hope. Because anytime we see someone that I'm like, okay, all right, you know, she's young and she's healthy and she's got all this, you know, going and awesome. We're going to watch this whole thing. So we, as a mom, I've watched your journey very closely. And again, it's kind of helped me from the mom aspect, seeing just how real and vulnerable and incredible that you are. And it's been so very helpful for us. And we both, Presley and I both watch you very closely, not Facebook stalkers, but just big Facebook fans. And, uh, and we appreciate it. We appreciate that. We appreciate seeing your journey and that there's people out there that are getting it out there. Cause I really think outside of you and, and Ashley, and I know there's a few other pages like that, but I think that's important because I literally, I take Ashley's stuff. I've taken your stuff and I send the things that you post and things that you write about that are things I've sat and thought about night after night after night. And I've not even written about, you know what I mean? It's hard for me to get it out there. And I think because it's my child, I don't always want to put that out there sometimes. So it's been helpful. And I've taken things that both you and Ashley have written. And I've sent that to my family members. I've sent that to my closest friends. I've sent that to some of his teachers. And so your words and your thoughts and your feelings have helped create the path that he's on and and people having a better understanding of that. And that's so important. And I feel like there's been several people I could name along the way, but definitely you and Ashley have been a huge one in that to just help put what I would love to say, but I just haven't gotten the courage yet or taken the time out there that I've been able to use that so people can kind of understand, you know, what it's like. So we appreciate you more than you know. Well, thank you. Seriously, writing is probably one of my top ways of processing. So full disclosure, if you do follow me on Facebook, I, I like, like Stephanie said, I, I don't 
I don't sugarcoat it. And I think, I don't know, it's, it's just everybody has a different way of processing. And some people are a little, a little more adept and, and comfortable with the verbal processing, whether it's through talking or through writing. And other people internalize things differently and better. I can't keep things internal because it drives me insane and I go wacko. I tend to like kind of implode if I keep it inside. And other people can handle it and they can, they can navigate that differently and better. I think my husband is kind of like that. He can like kind of hold on to things internally and not, not feel as stressed as I get if I don't like talk about it or express in some way, like what I'm thinking, what I'm feeling. But I really, I mean, I really appreciate that. And I'm sure Ashley does as well. She's definitely, definitely been a light of hope in the community, I think here as well. So, well, thank you both for being here. It really means a lot to me to have you guys back and just to be able to talk a little more in depth about kind of how things have shifted this last year or so since we've talked. And, and I really, Really appreciate you guys just for for being a, a huge part of raising awareness and and I hope you'll continue to like just courageously show up in your community even even when you're not initially recognized and just say hey we're over here too like don't forget about us because I think I think that's that's what happens that's that's why something like breast cancer became as common as commonly known as it is is because more and more obviously people were getting diagnosed but also people just kept talking about it so you know i know it's hard i know it's it sometimes is discouraging you know when you feel like well, people should be aware they should know like okay yes it's been four years since he was diagnosed but like he's still a cancer survivor you know like to to want that and so if you're not getting that awareness if you're not having those kinds of pieces happen in in your life or anyone listening like don't be afraid to go after it advocate for yourself whether it's in in the community setting in the doctor setting i think that those are powerful things that we can do so anyway thank you both just for being here and for taking the time i really appreciate it thank you thank you for having us we appreciate it and we're always rooting for you always always thank you guys so so